in the name of Jesus drought in your life that even when it is physical rainy season it is still dry season spiritually financially and otherwise I decree and declare let the rain begin to fall let the rain begin to fall let the rain begin to fall you welcome to another spirit filled message on christocentric message if you're new to this channel i would entreat you to hit on that subscribe button and then to like this video as well i would want you to share this message across because we believe that as this message is coming forth it's going to bless you your graces are going to be imparted onto you and then god is going to visit your home thank you for watching stay blessed so before we pray a little and sit, I want to encourage you, open up your heart. Um, there's no argument that here and there, many of us have tasted of certain dimensions of God. But you see, conferences like this are designed to lift us beyond what we have seen. Do not allow what you have seen and handled stop you from what you can see and handle. Hallelujah. Please hold someone's hands and let's begin to pray in one minute just to open up our hearts. Be seated if you can and then please be sensitive. You prayed for this meeting, you fasted for it and he has come. I cast my crown before your highest royalty. I am undone before your glorious majesty. I cast my crown before the highest royalty. I am undone before your glorious majesty. You're the King of kings and Lord of lords. You are the King of kings. You're the King of kings and Lord of lords. Your glorious majesty. Yabone na kau, sujata ne na kau, serking salama e, serking aljana. Yabone na kau, sujata e. of the living God I ask in a mighty way that within the few minutes that you have granted to unto your people let there be such grace that will be made available to understand your ways and to receive something that is true a substance of spiritual reality that we will receive something from tonight and all through this conference that will last our lifetime in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus. Please sit down. You see. The presence of God. Please listen very carefully. The presence of God. Is not anointing. The presence of God. Is not something that you coerce. By manipulation. The presence of God 
is hosted through intimacy. It's not some spiritual gibberish that you try to fabricate just because you are ministering in the presence of people. No. You can fake power, but you cannot fake intimacy. You can fake miracles, but you cannot fake an encounter. The Lord has prepared this platform not just for you to hear another preacher, but I believe that tonight's program is a resonance from the realm of the spirit, a reflection of the cry, the fastings, the prayer of God's people for something higher, for something more, for something true. I believe that this meeting is a response of someone's hunger in the secret place saying lord i have seen your glory but i know there can be more i have seen the prophetic but i know there can be more i have seen miracles but i know there can be more i have had access to deep dimensions of revelations but i know there can be more and truly there is more and so I believe with all my heart, listen very carefully, there are many ways you will know teaching will only be one of the ways. There are certain realities you will learn tonight that you will not be taught. It will come by the Spirit. There are certain levels of spiritual knowledge that cannot be articulated with words. It's a spirit communication. When you expose yourself to the light of His Spirit, it will be part of the things that you will carry along and eventually your mind will begin to understand the things that you have received and so let your heart be open whilst i teach be sensitive to the ministry of angels not just the ministry of the holy spirit i observe that our time is gone and i don't intend to keep us so long tonight but then i truly truly came Believing that you were serious when you put this program together. Believing that you meant what you wrote. Believing that you were not just trying to satisfy a campus spiritual program that happens. God only comes to those who mean it when they call him. He doesn't just come to those who call. He doesn't just come to those who speak. He discerns seriousness. His presence is too majestic to be toyed with. And he will vet the seriousness of your desire. And this is what I believe the Lord has brought us to do tonight. Oh, speak from your heavens and the earth will you. Will you speak from your throne and my ears will hear. Oh, speak from your heavens and this place will you. For my altar is calling you. Oh God, my sacrifice is calling you. Oh God, will you speak from the heavens and will hear from earth? Oh, speak from your heavens and I'll hear from the earth. My altar. Calling you, oh, my worship. Calling you, take my praise. I pray. 
Take my praise, take my praise. How can I do? Tiri do 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 tiri do. How can I do? I'm not just singing, I'm speaking to your spirit, man. Please sit down. Tonight you are learning the ways of the spirit. For the natural man cannot understand the things of the spirit. They are spiritually designed. Swallow your pride. Tonight come to the school of the spirit. Hey, hey. Don't you know in his hands have the keys to eternal life swallow your pride tonight it's the school of the spirit don't you know in his hands have the keys to eternal life so little here a little there and your day will dawn He's at work in you, changing everything. You are the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Take your place. Take your place. You're the Holy Ghost. Say, man, and a day, 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 and a Affect my life, breathe on me. Affect my life, breathe on me. Affect my life, breathe on me. Affect my life, Please sit down. They are not just songs, my brothers and my sisters. 
There are spiritual encodings that have been written upon your spirit man. They are only transmuted through singing. I'm not a musician. That's why you came. You came as a reflection of a dissatisfaction. Psalm 63. Psalm 63. Psalm 63. Please bring for me a lady right now that will shout loud under the anointing to the hearing of everyone. The power of God is coming on a lady. A loud shout to the hearing of everyone. Please bring that person for me. I stand, I stand in awe of you. I stand, I stand in awe of you. Holy God, to whom all praise is due. Psalm 63. Let's discuss something. The Lord is speaking to this lady. I'm taking away the reproach of your family. I don't know who this lady is, but is living right now, today, and forever. Never to return. In the name of Jesus Christ. I am opening your eyes to see. This is a word for someone. Not everybody. Don't just please. Let's not disorganize this. I'm ministering by the spirit. When I talk to you, the power of God comes upon you if you are the person. It has nothing to do with, um, I just want to receive. No, these are exact words. I am opening your eyes. The Lord is granting the spirit of revelation. You see in the eyes of an ego. M Mommy, our mother is one of the women. The Lord is opening the eyes of this our mother. I don't know you, Ma, but I'm seeing fire come upon your eyes that you will see. That you will see. There are eight more people. Eight more people. Two of them are in the choir stand. I see by the Spirit. Silas Kalambrahas Kadabarushia Dakata. I see an angel of the Lord standing on this row and says there are two people, right? Just please sit. You don't have to stand. Just on this row as I stand. Right to the back, front to the back. There are two people here. That grace. Two of them. Hello, Madonna. Hey, 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 hey. Hello, Hello, Madonna. Hey, hey, hey. Hello, Hold on. I don't know if this guy is a man of God, but I'm seeing a grace for the prophetic. I don't know who this gentleman is. Please shift this man on the floor. We'll, we'll, tomorrow we'll take our time to do the impartation not tonight i'm just ministering as a spirit this gentleman on the floor i'm seeing a grace that is coming upon you your life will never never be the same never ever be the same never ever be the same the angel of the lord is asking me to stand here and he's saying there are two people here hold on please you don't have to stand the lord is granting you a strange grace from the miraculous signs two of you right now right now two of you stepping into that dimension
Am I wasting your time tonight? But thou, O oh Lord, had a shield for me. You're oh my glory. You're the lifter of my head. But thou, O oh Lord, had a shield for me. Hallelujah. Someone in the minister's role here, I just saw light come on someone. On the, I don't know who that person is, but the power of God is coming on you now. I hope you are not embarrassed that I'm speaking to the ministers. In the name of Jesus, I don't know who that person is, but I'm seeing an anointing coming on that person. Please sit down. Please sit down. Please sit down. Jesus. Sit down. Palush habrandas kebaru sagadabalakatash. My God. What is Owocho? Owocho, is that somebody's name? Is there a name like that? Huh? Owocho, who is that? I'm hearing a name, Owocho. Owocho, please, when you find the person, I, I need to at least teach something, even if it is for five, ten minutes. Abigail, who is Abigail? Abigail, I hear a name Abigail. The Abigail I'm talking about is wearing a maroon shirt. You are a lady, you didn't cover your hair. You are wearing like a maroon shirt, a short handed shirt. This is what I'm seeing. Is there someone like that? Who is that? Hello, Madonna. Ah, yeah. ah, hello, hello, Madonna. Ah, ah, hello, Shalarus Kamarandash Kalabragadibas. My friend, look at me. Tap that gentleman. Ask him to look at me. Lift your hands. I'm seeing oil coming upon your head. I don't know who you are, but the spirit of revelation is coming on you right now. You will never be the same. I stretch my hands and I declare that grace. You will drink of it and you will rise to realms you never imagined. In the name of Jesus Christ. Where is Abigail? This is the lady. You are Abigail too. I want to pray for you. Huh? Where is your mother? Where is home? Okay, I will pray for you because I see the spirit of death roaming around your family. And the Lord is saying to counsel it. Don't be afraid. In the name of Jesus, I decree and declare. What I am rebuking from you, the Lord is rebuking from one lady in the choir now as I'm speaking. The manifestation of the spirit of death. You are Abigail too? Place your hand on your stomach. That pain goes now. Now! Out! Help her. Please sit down. Please sit down. Please sit down. Please sit down. Let's find somewhere to at least teach the word of God. Majesty. Psalm 63. Psalm 63. I will be sharing with you from today and through tomorrow.
the secrets of the kingdom that make for a man, a woman, a territory to be mightily used by God. Please listen carefully. Don't, don't mind those under the anointing. They will not interrupt you. They will be silent. In every generation, please listen to me, right from Bible days and all through modern history, it seemed as though in every land and in every territory, God would find a few people. Sometimes it could be an individual. Sometimes it could be a family, a nation, a group. That he would do mighty things in and through within the lifetime of that generation. There has never been a generation where God did not find a witness, a man or a woman that would represent his purposes. Like he's finding you right there. The power of God is coming on you, lifting your hands, finding you. So in every generation, there are men and women who by a formula that I will be showing you seem to posture themselves in an unusual dimension to be used by God within that dispensation. It has always been the cry of the Spirit to find men and women who will not only love God but will avail themselves of God. One of them from scripture was a man called David. And I want us to explore his psalm. Something David said would begin to give us the key and to usher us into these dimensions of understanding what it will take to host God in a territory, in a generation. What does it take? To not only bring revival, but to be revival. What does it take to be a representative in experience? That your presence within a territory represents the assurance, the surety, and the continuity of God's program. Here is a man who is accustomed to God's presence. A man who loved the presence of God more than the beauty of his royalty. And here's what he has to say. Oh God, thou art my God. He said, early will I seek thee. Timing matters in seeking God. He says, my soul thirsted for thee. My flesh longs for thee. In a dry and thirsty land where no water is. Why am I seeking this? It says to see thy power and thy glory so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Let me explain for you this prayer and this cry of this man of God. Lord, why do I come to church? And experience your mighty presence. Why do I experience signs and wonders? Why do I experience the grace to pray? Why do I experience a dimension of hunger when I'm in church? But then when I'm alone in my secret place, I don't seem to be able to transfer my experience that I have in church to my secret place. He says, I want to see your power in my life. The same way I saw it in the sanctuary. When I went for a crusade, I saw people healed. I saw people delivered. What was in that crusade that cannot be carried to my life? When I sat under a grace, I saw possibilities. 
What does it take, oh God, to transfer this reality as I saw in church, as I saw in a conference to my life? It says to see your power. It was a cry for an experience of a reality that until then was only seen corporately. Do I have to wait for a conference to experience your presence? Do I have to wait for a conference to see what the gifts of the Spirit looks like? Do I have to wait for a conference to access the Spirit of Revelation? Oh God, I'm crying from my secret place. Transfer what happens in a conference to my life. Transfer the hunger that comes in the conference to my life. Transfer the prayer. Transfer the passion. Transfer the grace. To see your power and your glory as I have seen in the sanctuary. There was a dimension of you I saw in church that I don't have in my life. I thought you don't speak again until I came to church. Lord, what is wrong when I'm alone? Bring that voice to my secret place. Why do I pray two hours in church and I cannot pray five minutes alone? Transfer that same grace to see it in my life so that I become a testament of the possibilities that reside in the Christ. Let me not only be a hearer, I want it in my life. This is a man praying. I show you the secrets of the spirit. It is not enough just to love God. It is not enough just to be born again. Listen to me carefully. It is not enough to even be willing to serve God. There are conditions. My brothers and my sisters, God loves everybody, but he cannot use everybody. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Just because you are available does not mean you are usable. The Bible says there are vessels that are unto dishonor. And there are vessels that are unto honor. The transition of the vessels is not dependent on God. He say, if a man, it is left for you. To transit yourself to become a vessel that is unto honor. It says meat for the master's use. What then is the price to be used by God? What is the price, my brothers and my sisters, to be a mighty vessel of God here in the land of Kogi State? or in this campus what is the price if there is a price then this conference was designed to show you what is the price that will make your song not only be a special number but a ladder that people will climb to the throne room what is the price that makes your voice not only just the speakings of men, intellectual communication, theological exegesis, what translates your voice from just being a communicator to a revealer of the mysteries of the kingdom. He says, my heart is indicting a good matter. Then he says, my tongue is the pen of a ready writer. That you can write mysteries upon the hearts and the lives of people. What is the price to pay that when men see you, I hope you know that not everybody climbed up the mountain to see the face of God. God called only one man, Moses, see my face. The rest don't need to look at me. They should look at you. They can have the same experience. You have come down from that mountain with something that is the same. And so by looking at you, they can encounter what they would have had on that mountain. What does it take 
to be in experience a representative of heaven. Now, please sit down. Please sit down. I will not keep you long. I love the body of Christ and I am, I am so honored to be teaching the collective, the coming together of the church upon this campus. It is a beautiful experience. Listen to me. The greatest need in the body of Christ right now is not necessarily more revelation. Please listen to me. There is no time in history. I, I doubt, I may be wrong, but I'm a, a student of the move of God. And there is no time in modern history where there is such a downpour of spiritual revelation in the body of Christ as it is right now. Men and women all over this nation, all over Africa, and all over the world have been granted by the eyes of the Spirit to see dimensions in God, to understand depths. This is not the generation where you impress people by the depth of revelation because there are people who have gone really deep. Listen very carefully. Your edge is not revelation. Understand what I'm saying. Don't write it down. Just listen to what I'm saying. Once upon a time where the basis for the respect and the honor that comes to you as a man of God is the scarceness of the mysteries and the revelations that you dispense. Why? Because at that time, very few people understood certain principles of the kingdom so far. So sometimes you could find one man in a whole territory who would be able to properly articulate certain dimensions of God. But no more. Because there has been a multiplication of the grace and the dimensions for revelation. So that you can find even in a campus like this with students who are engaged in learning and still you will find men and women who are deeply grounded in revelation who have stretched their spiritual understanding from border to border. So the challenge is not ignorance. We know many things. There are very few things in all honesty. Any serious Christian who has been properly mentored in this nation and in Africa there are few things a man of God will teach that will be new. They will largely be fresh, not new. Because by the grace of God, and I boldly give credit to the many men and women of God within this nation and in Africa, we may not have done the best, but I think we have done something commendable to help the body come into some level of understanding. But let me tell you where the problem is. The lady on red, lay your hands on that lady shouting. Just do what I ask you to do. I didn't say pray, don't do anything. Just do what I ask you to do. This, just, just leave, just leave. This lady, you looking at me, lay your hands on that lady. Just do what I ask you to do. I didn't say pray, don't do anything. Just do what I ask you to do. Thank you, Jesus. 
Please be patient with me. God is doing something in their lives. After which they, will, they are not shouting for nothing. They will be silent shortly. But there is something that God is doing. Thank you, Jesus. We bless you. Leave them. Sit down. Just leave them and sit. Let's continue. It's okay. Leave them. You're done. You finish your work. Just sit. Now listen everybody. Let me tell you what I believe is one of the greatest issue with the body of Christ. We lack the level of encounters that can defend the propositions we claim about God. Please listen. Conferences in this nation and around the world are full of very, very challenging spiritual propositions. We know the things God can do. We know what he should do. And many times we make bold statements. But the, the, the grace requirement to validate the claims, that is the missing link. And so our experiences are full of a lot of emotion and intellect but void of conviction. Why? Because the level of grace to demonstrate the validity of the things we claim is not there. And you see, over time, let me tell you this, over time, what has happened? You don't have to bring those under the anointing out. Don't, don't worry. Aside from those who are already out. Listen. Over time, do you know what has happened? Members are already used to our... The, the limit of our communication to be just in theory. So you hear the songs we sing. God is mighty. He can change your life overnight. And members dance and they don't believe what they are singing. Because they have been trained that it is only a ritual. It's as though there is no experience. There is no substance. So a man of God can preach so boldly like I'm preaching. And return back to his secret place and say, I hope what I preached is true. I, I just hope God you would defend me. Because I made a lot of bold statements in your name. I hope I am right. It's a terrible thing to represent Christ from a standpoint of fakeness. There is a level of persuasion and conviction. He says, but I know whom I have believed and I am persuaded. Conviction. Conviction. So we sing all kinds of songs. God can change a man's life and people say amen. God can lift a man, amen. God can anoint a man, amen. God can give revelation, amen. And when all the theory is done, brothers and sisters, we stand and make God look like a fool in the presence of the people. So the psalmist said, I'm tired of pretense. Lord, show me your power. I do not want a Christianity that is only full of falling down and standing up and touching and turning people up, down. And there is no growth, no transformation, no substance of the reality of the life of God. Many things that we preach, we are not truly sure of. We only heard men of God that we respect preach it. So while listening to the message, we took notes. And we saw that those notes are excellent. And we transferred those notes to our various platforms. And preached it just like we had. But it has not become substance. Our results show that there is a gap between that revelation and our conviction. 
Are we together? The same way you can hear, for instance, a man of God write a song. And you can come and stand and sing the same song. You can even kneel down and cry while you sing it. But you are surprised at the effect. Because every song has a grace and a presence that comes with it. But now you are singing that song. But the people cannot discern the grace and the presence that should back that song. It means it was just a special number. Please listen, brothers and sisters. I want to show you a very powerful secret that will change your life. The challenge with the body of Christ is not ignorance. It is the substance of spiritual reality. The grace and the power to be able to validate the things we claim to know and have seen about God. How many people will tell you they have seen Jesus? How many people will tell you they see angels every day? Go and read the Bible and see what happened to a man who saw just one angel. Yet we claim every time that we are seeing them on stage, pastors, and the effect that befits that level of encounter does not follow. There are people who claim to, I'm not being sarcastic, please. There are people who claim to see Jesus every day and in every service. Jesus, go and find out. When Saul of Tarsus saw Jesus, even those who didn't see were affected. They knew something happened. There is, there is something wrong. And if it is not corrected, a day will come after 10 years of ministry. You will turn back and say, look, I've been lying. I give up. And all those who have followed you will say, so what do we do now? You say, I wasn't sure myself. I was led that way. Hallelujah. He said, that which we have seen, that which we have heard, that which our hands have handled, even of the word of life, he says, that is what we teach. There is an experience of the kingdom, my brothers and my sisters. Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night in John chapter 3. And then this is what he says. Rabbi, we know that thou art a man sent from God, he says. For no man can do these things except God be with him. Notice in the afternoon they will claim that they didn't love him. But Nicodemus came to confess and said, don't mind all that nonsense we say in the afternoon. We know that you are a man sent from God. We see the substance. The things that our fathers told us, we see it in your life. And then Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Then Nicodemus replies and says, Will I in my old age now enter into my mother's womb the second time? And then Jesus says, I say unto you again, Except a man be born of water and of the spirit, then he changes his expression. He cannot enter an experience. Moses saw Canaan but didn't enter Canaan. Just because you have perceived realities, you know that miracles are part of the, the possibilities in God. You know restoration is part of the possibilities in God. You know that God can anoint men. It should not surprise you but the substance of that reality. You are, not, you are not in doubt that God can give speed. You are not in doubt that God can stay the hands of darkness over a family. See the kingdom. I know this is true. From where I stand, I can see the possibilities. But you need to enter into that experience so that it no longer becomes something you are saying are we together that is the difference between faith and trust faith is based on the integrity of the one who spoke to you you're believing the person you may not understand the dynamics of that operation if I tell you, for instance, come my friend, if I tell this gentleman, put your hand in my back pocket 
and you will bring out money. Remember, he was not there when I was dressing. He will need faith for this to happen. He will have to go to the archives of my dealings to find out whether I have a track record of being a liar or not. So he will find out who did you give this instruction to before and what happened. Based on the antecedents, he will now believe me. But watch this. If I continue to tell him every day to pick money out of my pocket, a day will come he no longer believes me because I'm a man of integrity. He believes me because of a track record he also has. That is trust. You are not hoping it will happen. There is a track record. You are not hoping lives will be changed. And so you are also watching to see. You have also come into oneness with the ways of God. And you know that you know the experience of the kingdom. That when you speak as a preacher, you are not asking someone, so how was my preaching? How was the service? Were you changed? No. You have come into an understanding of the power and the potency that comes with the word when it is explained properly and backed by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know lives will change. This is the missing link. Is the reason why our churches and fellowships are empty. Is the reason why we have members today and do not have members tomorrow. Is the reason why we ourselves are up spiritually and down. Backsliding has a science to it. There is an explanation. It's usually a product of repeated frustration. First secret. That you are just agreeing on a reality like every other person. But the substance of it is not in you. And the frustration that that pretense causes begin to have an effect on you. And it will get to a point where you no longer can bear it. And say, I'm tired of lying. We sing songs like, I was young and now I am old. I have never seen the righteous forsaken, no, he seed beg for bread. And whilst you are singing that song, the truth is you look at your life and you see that it's not true. It's not true. It was someone else's testimony. But it's not true. Listen to me. I came by the grace of God in this conference. Not just to teach you. But like an initiation. To bring you into a realm and a dimension. Of the substance of spiritual reality. That the things that some of you already know. That the grace and the ability to stand in that pedestal in the spirit where you can validate that claim. That you went home as a man of God and you said, I'm a student of KSU and they teach us well here. Alongside my academics have been trained spiritually. And they say, prove it. And you say, for instance, I've been trained that prophecy is powerful. And I speak that this family, let things turn around. But nothing happened. Remember, that question mark is still hanging in your family. So every time they say man of God, everybody says man of God except your loved ones. They have not seen a reason to agree. They, of course, they, they, they will have to just, they, they will smile just for the, the sense of nationhood. But they don't yet agree. But the day you tell them, I am truly a portal and a gateway from the throne to the earth. And let me prove it. Father, lift them. Just that prayer. And heaven moves in a way and manner. They will call you and say, sorry. Um, what did you say the other time? You say, no, what I said is not the issue. It was a relationship. Even if I said, God, bless them. Even if I said, you are blessed. It is not the linguistic accuracy. I'm just showing you what a portal can do on earth. It is impossible to claim that you host God. And then you stand in a place 
and the people cannot experience God. No. It's not about power. Listen. It's not about calling for manifestation. It's the effect of the dimension from which you stand in. Listen to me. Read the Bible. There was no time when a man was open to a vista in the spirit that those around were not affected by it. They didn't have to believe. Once you open a gateway that is higher than the three-dimensional realm, everybody within that spiritual circumference must know. It's true. When Jacob, in chapter 28 of Genesis, the Bible lets us know that Jacob placed a stone in loss and then he was to sleep. Lying down to sleep, Jacob suddenly is open to a dream and he sees a ladder that connects the earth to the heavens. Angels ascending and descending. Did you know that whether Jacob saw it or not, it was a reality that was happening? It was not his seeing that made it happen. And he said, the Lord was in this place and I knew not. He said, surely this is the house of God, the gate of heaven. That means there is a condition for every place to be called the house of God. It must have a gate from the ground there to the throne room. For any place to be called a church, a place, the house of God, the requirement is that there must be a portal from that place that touches the throne. If it is the house of God, it must have a gate that opens to the heavens. But let me share with you in the next two minutes, just one key, and then we'll continue tomorrow. What is the price? To see the power and the glory of God made manifest. Price number one is the price of consecration and surrender. Please write it down. The first spiritual requirement for any man, any woman, any church, any organization, any territory to be able to host God in superior dimensions within the lifetime of that dispensation. Please listen very carefully. Now, let me teach you something you need to understand. Um, uh, like I said, tomorrow, by God's grace, we'll have some more time to teach before um, we do the impartation and so on and so forth. When you read Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, the Bible tells us that thanks be to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who had blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Everybody say all spiritual blessings. So you have to understand certain information here. Please look up. Number one, that we have been blessed with how many spiritual blessings? All spiritual blessings. But that they are routed through the Christ. That means for the believer, listen carefully, the foundation of your spiritual journey is your encounter with the Christ. Are we together now? It, is, it has to be in that progression that when you encounter the Son of God, Apostle John was writing and he said, this is the record, he says, that God has given us the way, we call it eternal life. He says, and this life is in his Son, so that whosoever hath the Son hath that life. Are we together now? So, when you encounter the son of the living God, you have his life. And part of the packages that come potentially, as Apostle Paul is teaching the church in Ephesus, is that we have been blessed with all spiritual blessings. That they are spiritual in context. Number two, that they reside in the heavenlies. Number three, they are only routed through the Christ. Now, you on, I, I, there's a reason why I came to this scripture. Because many believers, and I'm glad that there are all kinds of denominations here, and you need to understand this. It is a fact 
that the realities that we seek to come into are not things that God is necessarily trying to give us. They are realities that have been provided for. They reside in the Christ and that they are accessible to the saints when the saints are in the Christ. Are we together now? This is doctrine. You must understand this. It's very important. So you are not necessarily trying to coerce or manipulate the hand of God to release something that is outside of the possibilities that have been resident in the Christ. The Bible says all spiritual blessings. And that includes the grace that you seek to experience within this conference. That it resides in the Christ. Are we together now? But the second thing I want to teach, and that's why I brought forth this scripture. We're rounding up. Is that there are two dimensions. Please listen. In the dealings of God with man, as far as his word reveals to us, there are two dimensions of his spiritual operation. Say two dimensions. When God speaks, he speaks from these dual dimensions. And if we do not understand it, it will be both the origin and, and, and the, 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 the basis for our confusion, our imbalance, our error, and our lack of experience in spiritual realities. The first dimension, I call it the prophetic speakings of God. Now listen, when God speaks, he speaks from a prophetic dimension. It is in his character. I hope you know that God is not limited by time. Are we together now? I hope you know that God is not even limited by eternity. God cannot be limited by eternity because eternity is also a function of time. Eternity is the summation of infinite dispensations. It is also governed by time. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, it says in the beginning, not from the beginning, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That means he was in neither of the two. You have to be outside a thing to create it. Are we together now? Please listen, listen. Sit down, sit down. I'm teaching you something. So if he created the heavens and the earth, he was somewhere that was neither heaven or earth. Are you getting what I'm saying now? Yes. And when the apostles saw him, he called that realm a dimension of unapproachable light. Please listen very carefully. Understand what I'm teaching you. So when God speaks, he speaks from that. Uh, dimension is not a good word. He speaks from that realm. And based on that realm, the communication should not look like it is time dependent. That is proof that it came from his realm. That means if God talks to you from that realm, he will not attach time to his speakings. He is Alpha Omega. The word and is not there. Alpha Omega. When you say God is Alpha and Omega, it means if he is in one place, he can't be at the other place. And here, I can't be both at the same time. But when you call him Alpha and Omega, he does not have to be in the end. Are you getting what I'm saying? That, that dimensional concept of movement to get to the end is something that only humans experience. In fact, even once you are higher than the three-dimensional realm, some of those dimensions don't even exist. Please listen very carefully. So he is Alpha Omega. That means that in the speakings of God, if you just stay and listen raw, just the way God talks, you are not going to know whether the thing has happened or will happen. Everything from God's standpoint has happened. There is no future in God. God does not have a future. Please understand this. If God has a future, who is bringing it? The, the concept of tomorrow, listen, please. You need to understand this thing. The concept of tomorrow does not happen with God. The concept of forever does not happen with God. There are borrowed terminologies to help the saints understand God. In his realm, those vocabularies don't exist. There's no such thing as tomorrow. 
There's no such thing as yesterday. In fact, there's no such thing as today. In God's realm is now. Please listen. Now, that's a realm that no man can understand by himself. So you will understand how the Bible was written. When the Holy Spirit came upon holy men, they wrote, they did not understand what they were writing. When you read the Bible, you are going to see a lot of spiritual realities that the Bible tells you have been finished, are done. For instance, from the foundations of the earth, the lamb was slain. So if you had read that scripture before the arrival of Jesus, if Jesus came to the earth, you would say that's an error. He has already come. He has already died. The speakings of God. Are you getting what I'm saying now? Based on that dimension, everything there is finished, is done. But because God is dealing with men, and when he created earth, he carved out a dimension of times and seasons. He needs to break down his dealings to accommodate the system he put with men. The second dimension of his speaking or the dealings of God is the experiential manifestation in the world and the life of men. Please listen. So there, is, there are prophetic realities from God's standpoint and then there is the experiential manifestation of those things. In God's mind, there should be no sinner on earth again. Do you agree with me? In God's mind, there should never be a need for an altar call again. Because based on what Christ did, there is no reason for one person to still be unsaved. But in experience, there are still people going to hell. In experience, there are still territories that are unsaved. So when you go to save sinners, you are not negating the reality of what Christ has done. You are creating the platform for it to manifest experientially in the world of men. If you don't understand these dimensions, I just thought you will never be able to walk in the power of God. Because when God speaks to you, you think he will say, I will anoint you. He will look at you and say, I hope the anointing is working in you. And you say, Lord, which one now? That's his realm. When God speaks to you, he does not say, go and farm. He says, I hope you are eating the crops. And he says, God, for which farm now? While he's talking, seeds are not yet on the ground. You have to know how he speaks. You have to know how to translate his speakings to edify you. This is the mistake with the body of Christ. So we pick the prophetic speakings of God, bring it to the world of men, and act as if the world of men does not have time components. It does. There are times and seasons when the word came to the earth. What happened? He grew. Everybody say he grew. He subjected himself to time and process. And Jesus grew. Why would the word grow? But he grew. So while it is true that God has given us everything, I'm digressing a bit. I've not even started explaining point one. But then I'm teaching you that everything you are about to receive from God's prophetic standpoint has been given to you. But you're receiving it in experience. It's not like many people may want to look at it. You are not trying to negate the fact that Christ has given it. You are aligning with the conditions that make for it to be manifest in your life. For instance, let me use a common example. We talk a lot about the blessing, right? The, the blessing of the Lord. I know you know by now, you've listened to preachers all around the world that say you are already blessed. You are not going to be blessed. You are blessed. But you put your hands in your pocket and bring it out and you will find reason to think again and say, so where is it? So when you get a job, for instance, and they begin to pay you salary and you put your hand. Remember two years before you put your hand, you were blessed. And nothing happened. Two years later, you put your hands with a job. And now money is coming out, for instance. And you look at it. You, it is not your, your walking now gave substance to that reality. 
Are you getting what I'm saying now? So there are many believers who do not see a need to grow in the power of God. Why? Because they believe all the power has been given. And all the power that has been given, not one of it is working in their lives. This is a mistake. The prophetic speakings of God is not a lie. But the ability to come to the world of men and translate that reality is not there. So there are people who will tell you, no, I can't be a failure. The Bible says I'm a success and you are right. But in experience, there is nothing that shows that. So Paul teaching the Hebrew says, he was quoting the Psalm of David. He says, there is nothing to be put under his feet that he, do not, he did not put. He said, but now we do not yet see. We do not yet see. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 6. I apologize. Um, just give me two minutes. You see why I was contemplating whether to teach or not. It takes a while to help people understand. Let's go to verse 8 so that I just round up. Verse 8. Okay, let's, or oh, 7. Let's look at 7. That's, that's what I'm really looking for. Now, watch this. Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. You know that, you know that scripture, right? The Psalm of David. He's quoting it now. And has crowned him with glory and honor. Notice, he has done it already. And did set him, this is man, over the work of your hands. Verse 8. Thou hast put how many things? He's talking of the prophetic dimension of God's reality. Thou hast put all things under his feet. For in that he put all things in subjection, he left what? Nothing that was not under him. That means in God's mind, man, you have total control. But now in experience, but now, but in our realm, but in this frame of reality, we see not yet. It looks like a contrast. No. It's the same explanation from two different dimensions. From our standpoint, we do not yet see all things. So it's possible to go to bed and see the ministry already built. And see the headquarters already finished. It's not a lie. And you wake up and all through your lifetime, you will never enter there. It's possible to get to the realm of the spirit and see a five points. You saw your CGPA, but when the result comes out, you see 1.5. And you say, what happened? Between that reality and this reality, you miss something that authorized that disparity. This is what I want to teach you. You saw the man alive and did not die in the realm of the spirit. And you say, ah, he's going to live. I've seen it in a vision. You are correct. But two days later, he died physically. Now you are wondering, I don't know if I'm the only one here, but many of you are in a dilemma, contrasting realities. You were praying for the meeting as a man of God and you saw signs and wonders. And when you went for that meeting, you even saw the person you saw in your vision sitting on the wheelchair, but you rounded up that meeting and he didn't stand up. But remember in the vision, you saw him jumping. Something is wrong. But now, we do not yet see but now, we do not yet see that anointing that God says is on you, on you. But now, we do not yet see that dimension of grace. What then is the dynamics, the system of conversion that can take the spiritual reality that is complete from the Father's standpoint to the Christ and make it manifest in your life? This is what I am teaching you. I took out all this long journey because we come from different ministries and different denominations. And if I approach the subject of consecration and surrender, just hearing it without this explanation, you may be in the dark. There will be contrasting beliefs. Are you getting what I'm saying now? Now let's go to the first point. And then we'll pray. I said the first key is consecration and surrender. No, not Ephesians 1.3. That's not the verse for surrender. I just digress to put the scripture there. The Bible says, listen to me. It says, nevertheless, 
the foundation of the Lord. Please listen to me. Standard sure. Having this seal. There is a seal on that foundation. The Lord knoweth them that are his. That means not everybody is his. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And then he says, let everyone that named the name of Christ do what? I thought naming the name of Christ should have freed you from it. He says, if you name the name of Christ by yourself, depart from what? Iniquity. Verse 18. I mean, I'm 20 now. I meant to say. But in a... Now, this is not talking about... Notice that all the vessels he's about to mention are inside the great house. None of this vessel is outside the great house. They are all inside. Both the vessels of honor and dishonor, they are all inside. So, he's talking about a family affair. Just because you are born again does not mean that is all. You are in that house, like the Ark of Noah, but there are different levels and kinds of vessels. The Bible says, but in a great house, listen, there are not only vessels of what? Gold and silver, but of wood and of clay or earth. He says some vessels are unto honor and some unto dishonor. 21. What is the condition? He says, if a man, therefore, shall purge himself from this he shall be he shall be that means until then he is not he shall be a vessel unto honor sanctified comma and then meet for the master's use the master wants to use men but not everybody in that house is qualified to be used please listen to me believers there is a level of genuine surrender. I hope you know when you give, when you get born again. I know we say that you gave your life to Christ, but that's not a condition for being born again. In being born again, you don't give your life to Christ. You receive his life. There is no mention of a man giving his life to Christ to be born again. When the Bible talks of giving your life, it talks of surrender for service salvation is receiving the life of god when god now begins to make demand of your own life then it is because he wants you to be used i beseech thee therefore brethren that you what offer your bodies he was talking in terms of service offer your bodies unto god holy and acceptable he says which is your reasonable act of service or worship I tell you why many believers cannot host the power of God. I tell you why many people cannot walk in the dimensions that they desire in Christ. We do not know the difference between being consecrated or not being consecrated. We just believe generically that every vessel, just because the Lord is rich unto all, we believe that automatically we are okay like that. No, sir. Truly speaking, let me tell you sincerely, there is a depth of surrender and consecration. A separation. An understanding, listen to me, that Christ must be Lord and must be priority and must be everything. The jealousy of God does not allow him to share a place with anything in your life. It is not enough for God to be in your heart. Where in your heart is he? Your heart is like a chamber. Your heart is like a house. If I'm in your toilet, I'm in your house. If I'm in your garage, I'm in your house. But I, I will not be honored being in the garage in your house. So it's not enough for Jesus to be in your life. Where is he in your life? He begins to cry until he sits at the throne of your heart. Let me tell you this. The price of surrender is death. Everybody say death. Hmm. You may not like what I'm saying, but it is true. The price of genuine surrender and consecration is death. You must become a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. 
it says so then death walks in us that life will walk in you only dead vessels can carry god the weight of god is too heavy for you to carry when you are alive i have been crucified with christ galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 says nevertheless i live yet not i but Christ that lives in me. He says, and the life that I now live in the flesh that is the body, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Believers, let me tell you this. The degree to which you are died, death to the flesh, death to the things of this world, a detachment experientially. He says, love not the world, neither the things of the world, He's not saying don't have them. The word is eros. An affinity to the things of this world that can make them become God to you. He says, love not the world. Neither the things that are in this world. He says, whoever loves um, this world, the love of the Father is not in him. Then he categorizes the things of this world into three. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. I have seen many preachers who want the power of God and their motif. They are not yet dead. The reason and the motif is to have something to outshine others. The reason you know you are dead when there is only one word in your mouth. Lord, it is not my will, but your will be done. Those who are alive in themselves have their wills. And they impose it. They use God to achieve their wills. The language of dead men is, Lord, nevertheless, not my will. It is what you want, not what I want. I'm not using you to achieve my plans. I stand back and I allow you to be Lord in experience of my life. That my life is like an offering like they sang to see you glorified. That's it. I have no business building any empire. Please listen to me. I've taken a little of your time, but you must hear this. Praying impartation and praying mantles will just be jamboree and stories. Until the vessel is on fire, that's when the glory comes. Every time the glory came upon the temple, there was already a sacrifice burning. It's important to understand this. One secret upon my life, I know that you have been blessed by the teachings and our ministry. Let me tell you this. It is more than fasting. It is more than prayer. This man you see standing before you, I've surrendered my entire will. Truly speaking. Truly speaking. Truly speaking. I have no business raising any empire or anything for myself. No. No. Looking for fame. Looking for this now. Thank God for all of the honor. But God sees my heart and he sees my life. This man standing before you is a dead vessel. That God, whatever you can do with me, please do. If it's possible and you desire to use me to represent the face of your possibilities to a generation, I am there. If you can make that commitment tonight, then you share your grace and go and sleep. And you will know that you've taken a step to the place of the anointing. The first requirement to make the oil is to crush it. The oil does not fall from the olive on the tree. It goes through that crushing. Please understand this. Many of you here seated looking at me. You are well-meaning and sincere. But you have not yet assumed the posture for true spiritual power. The corruption and the tendencies that reside in our hearts. And please don't feel bad. I'm not trying to insult you. I love you with all my heart. I'm only revealing to you a reality that will allow us to press for brokenness. So that we can host the glory of God. And the glory of God will feel comfortable on you the same way it is in heaven. There will be no difference. Because you are broken completely. Surrender. Not a name for yourself. All you want is to see Jesus glorified. All you want 
is to see his kingdom come. Not to build an empire. Apostle Joshua Selman. Have you heard about that great man of God? Have you heard about those wonderful things? Thank God for those things. But my brothers and my sisters, if you are trying to use God as an instrument to get fame, his jealousy will fight you. He sits in a class all by himself. God can give you something and still fight it. When it, anything that stands his way, including you, is his enemy. I show you the first key. Surrender. That's it. You can fast and not surrender. You can pray for eight hours and not surrender. Just because you were told that prayer can activate the anointing. You go back and pray and dissipate a lot of spiritual energy in hope to draw every ounce of strength. You can study Greek and Hebrew words with the desire to prove your level of spiritual competence and by so doing gain some kind of respect among the space of men of God and believers. And the heart of God continues to vet your sincerity. While all of that motion is going on, you find out that you fast for 40 days and you never live with any power. You study and study and study and you never live with any power because all those things are only activated on the altar of surrender. Spiritual activities are useless. The key to God's power is not fasting. The key to God's power is not prayer. The key to God's power is not night vigil. The key to God's power is not sowing seeds. All those things only make sense when you are dead. Try them from the depravity and the corruption of your heart and you will be disappointed. Is the reason why many people do it and when they don't find it, they say, this man, something is wrong because I did what I think should. Not a... a, a a charmer. Take it down, Mike. Let's rise. For your glory, I will do anything just to see you, to behold you rise. For your glory, Lord, I will do anything just to see you, to behold you as my king. want to be where you are, want to be where one prayer point. Father, every tendency to build an empire using your grace, every corruption in my heart, every desire for vain glory, fame outside you, an attempt to want your power for self-aggrandizement, an appetite to outshine my colleagues. Let that flesh be laid upon the altar of sacrifice tonight. Are you praying? Are you praying? Hallelujah. Acts chapter 1. And verse 8. Jesus had mentored the disciples. We'll sit down shortly. Training them. Please sit, sit. Go ahead. Jesus spent three years plus mentoring his disciples, teaching them the ways of God and then he departed routing through the gate of death please listen carefully then they were now confused he had spoken to them about the reality of the father 
he had spoken to them about the possibilities that the kingdom he was proposing to them carried. And now Jesus had gone and they were afraid. To the point that Peter felt disappointed alongside the other disciples. And when you read John 21, don't turn there. He said, I go a fishing. Let me go back to what I was doing before he called me. Because it looked like there was no future to his destiny again. He had left fishing to follow Jesus in hope that Jesus would conquer Herod and Caesar and establish a new kingdom. And that being the members of his cabinet, they would find a place when he were exalted. Now Jesus had gone and left them in trouble. So in that frustration, Peter said, I go a fishing. Then the other disciples also said, we go with you. Let's return back to our lives. Cut the long story short. Jesus comes back to life. And then eventually they are in the upper room. The same room where they had the communion. And the Bible says for a period of 40 days after his resurrection, he kept teaching them on the matters of the kingdom. The remaining part of the lecture he did not cover. He was quickly trying to cover it. Are we together? And in one of the teachings, he began to speak to them in Acts chapter 1 about the restoration of the nation of Israel. The physical restoration that happened historically. He was telling them that a time would come when the nation of Israel would be free from the liberty, the influence, and servitude from the Roman government. So they were excited. And then they said, will you at this time restore the nation of Israel? Jesus replies and says, it is not for you to know the times that the Father has put within his care. Then verse 8, he says, but ye shall receive power. This is the information that is sufficient for you. That you shall receive power. Anything you can receive, you can reject too. But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Now, please listen very carefully. He didn't say you will receive power and choose whether you love and want to be with the Holy Spirit. No. Rephrase this. That the Holy Ghost will come first. And then in his doing something to you, you will receive power. It is not the power that brings the Holy Ghost. It is the Holy Ghost that brings the power. Among many other things that he brings. And then the Bible says that that ministry of the Holy Spirit, please listen. Alongside the power that he brings will make you a witness everybody say witness it says you shall be witnesses unto me both in jerusalem in judea samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth this is jesus teaching now and when he made this statement the bible tells us that he stood and began to levitate into the heavens and a cloud of witnesses came and received him and two angels came and comforted the people and that was the end of the matter now listen very carefully you shall receive power but the first thing that will happen to you come is that as a naive weak believer he said a personality will be introduced to you give me your hands the holy ghost that it is in partnership with the holy ghost that eventually among the many things that he brings to your life is power. Please listen. That means that when you reject the Holy Spirit and all that he represents, you will also reject the power that comes with him. You have to understand this. Many believers want anointing. Many of you want a situation where you see very heavy spiritual power at work in your life in your ministry in your academics etc and it is god's desire to make you that anointed but not outside of the holy spirit please you must understand this when you meet with a herbalist he will conjure a charm and give it to you 
a personality physically as it were does not have to follow you don't even need a relationship it was so designed that spiritual power in this kingdom is a derivative of a relationship please listen carefully you don't need to know the name of a herbalist to receive his charm you don't even need to know his tribe you just need to come and say mister i need a b c and he gives you something and you do the rituals and that's it but in this kingdom that when you desire power the power is towards something being a witness but first and foremost you are not qualified for that power until god sees the regard come for the holy spirit so the holy spirit comes first and then what happens between you and him now listen please oh dear i pray that god will give us understanding we'll pray you know because of things like impartation because of things like mediums you can carry a handkerchief oil etc etc most believers are gradually getting away from the need and the appetite to know the person of the holy spirit why because it looks like it is very difficult to relate with him so i easily relate with an oil I'm seeing a bottle of oil anointed by an anointed man. I place it on my head and right, I begin to work miracles. We like those things. Impartation is not wrong. You're going to receive it in the night. But listen to me very carefully. I teach you the path of sustainable spiritual power. That the Holy Ghost comes first. It is the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life. There are certain things that he does in your life. And then it qualifies you to now not only host his power, but to be able to dispense it in a way that translates you to be a witness. Listen very carefully. Your assignment as revealed by God himself is to be a witness. Not a man of God. Not a student. Not a banker. Listen carefully not an apostle not a prophet all of those things are the geography of your witness so if god is sending you to equip the body then you are called apostle prophet etc if god is sending you into the finance realm you are called a businessman a ceo but in god's economy we are all called witnesses a witness is a validator of a claim listen very carefully until there is a basis for contention a witness is not necessary when you go to the court of law please listen if this gentleman um were caught stealing and he was summoned in court and the gentleman refuses and says, no 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 i did not carry anybody's property usually the judge will say is there a witness someone who was probably an eyewitness or someone who can come and validate the claim many things jesus said when he was on earth he said many things about heaven he said many things about the love of the father now listen very carefully the manifestation of his power on earth in his lifetime was not just a revelation of the sovereignty of heaven it was also a revelation of the love and the benevolence of the father are we together now remember the object of god's activity with man is and god so loved the world so his love has always been his motivation for interacting with men listen carefully not a desire to be served not a desire to be king the motivation behind God's dealings with men. Because you see, if you don't understand the love of God, you will think he's a biased and cruel king who just wants people to surrender all and keep serving him as though an insecure king. No. For God so loved the world. Apostle John also taught us, he said, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. Are we together now? In that we are called sons of God so we're not in doubt of the love of god when the power of god comes upon your life and the miracles the signs and the wonders like he did jesus he revealed the glory of the father 
And the highest dimension of the Father's glory is his love. I hope you know the love of God is part of his glory. The glory of God is every dimension that makes him God. The highest of them being love. So the Bible says this beginning of miracles, the wedding in Cana, Jesus did and manifested his glory. There is a dimension of God's glory that he seeks to be revealed. The dimension of his love the dimension of his grace, the dimension of his power. And so listen, because of this motivation, he will empower you so that you will go and correct a misunderstanding about him. Now listen, the earth is at the mercy of what the saints teach and show them about God. Their interpretation of who God is, is from the lens of the excellency of the stains. That means that if there is a dimension of God's power and grace that my life cannot reveal, I will erroneously mentor a territory into believing that God cannot be that. Listen carefully. Remember Jesus came as an expression of the Godhead. Are we Bible students here? So we're not in doubt as to the fact that you, whatever, because you see, until then, they never knew God. In the Old Testament, God could not be known. Are we together? He could be heard. He could be believed. But there was no possibility of a personal relationship with God at a corporate level. It couldn't have been possible. God will isolate individuals. And on the basis of covenant, he will reveal dimensions of himself to them. And then authorize them to share that dimension with the people. That was why when you read in the Old Testament, they attributed anything supernatural to God. Whether it was good or evil. It was a reflection of their limited understanding about God. There are religions in the world today that still do that. Every occurrence at all. That is outside of the scope of science. They attribute it to God. Now Jesus comes as the word made flesh. An example of who God is. Watch this. He's in the temple in Luke chapter 4. And they brought to him a scroll of Isaiah to read. He reads his own prophecy. And he says this day is this scripture fulfilled. Then he looks at someone with a withered hand. Everybody say power. He looks at someone with a withered hand and says, stretch your hand. And the man stretched his hand. It was a miracle. Everyone was surprised. Never had a priest and any of the people demonstrated God that close. They had proposed that God was powerful. But here and now, bringing the reality that resided in the heavens. The kingdom is within your hand, your reach. You can grasp it. Please understand what I'm sharing this morning. And then we pray. When Jesus saw a woman who had been stricken with fever, Peter's mother-in-law, the Bible says he reached and grabbed her and took her. When Jesus got to a place where there was no fish, he gave an instruction and all of a sudden they caught so much fish. When Jesus went and saw Jairus' daughter and then the centurion, he brought them back to life. The question was, the power of God was helping him to demonstrate something. Please listen very carefully. And now he said, just like me, when you receive this power, it will make you to become a witness, a validator of everything we have agreed that God is. There are many things the Bible says God is. And there are many things the Bible says God is not. Satan's assignment is to disprove everything God has claimed he is. Listen to me carefully. So when Satan oppresses this brother and his family and everything around him and he's not rising, nobody is moving forward. It's not about oppression. Satan is using this man like a painter will use a canvas to draw something. Satan is using man to speak to God. Are you getting the idea now? God, if you claim you are love, 
And if you claim creation should believe that you are love, why is this man this way? So there is a contention between the devil attempting to sabotage on God's claims. And God sits down as though helpless in heaven, waiting for a witness, a validator. In other words, I am God and I am love. And the statement that Satan is making to me through man is wrong. But who will prove? Are you seeing that now? And until a man shows up, God remains like a liar. So he is misinterpreted based on the things that happen to men. So he says, you are witnesses. In other words, every time there is reason to doubt God, he sends you there. Every time. He searches for the territories where there is something about God that is not being believed. And he says, go and be a validator. When I said I can restore the years that the canker worm has stolen, I was not lying. And then the devil uses your academics and says, God, show this. This guy is in final year. One more session. Come and prove that you can restore. And God says, all right, let me show you what my kingdom and the power that resides within it can do and in one session how many sessions one session something will happen that you may not it will surprise you that in your second semester they go back and say sorry we don't understand what happened but a mistake was made in your cgpa there's something we discovered two years ago it's not about cgpa God is speaking back to Satan. I control time. There is something I can do. Listen. You have to discern the purpose of power. So there are statements from Satan to God. From God back to the earth. And the microphone that is used to speak is man. When Satan tears down your family, he's doing something to you. That's why many of you go back to your parents and they say, look, this God thing, bar, we did it when we were young. We we're serious and we served God and he didn't do anything. You see, an understanding was incorrectly constructed by the absence of power. The power of God could not be made bare and so certain results could not be seen. And that lack of result created an understanding about God that is dangerous and faulty. So he says, where is the witness that can arise from this family? And for many years, nobody will be able to arise. And then suddenly you show up. You show up with a lot of zeal, but no power. You see that? You shall receive power. There is a lot of points to prove on earth, Jesus says. But I cannot send you this way. You must receive power. First, the Holy Spirit is introduced to you. And there are many things that he will teach you. Jesus himself was talking about the Holy Spirit. He said, I have many things to tell you, but ye cannot bear them now. He says, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come. He says, he will guide you into all truth. He will take that which is mine and he will give it to you. He will show you things to come. Is that not what the Bible says the Holy Spirit would do? So he comes into your life and begins to activate your organs of interaction with the realm of the spirit. And he helps you to know the word of God. And he constructs your spiritual understanding to be able to host greater dimensions of his power. Then as a reward for your staying with him, you receive power. It's not something that generically happens. I think there is a lot of... Um, you see, let, let me teach you something. And I don't mean to be sarcastic. Love everybody. But please, before you receive from people, vet the results that follow what they say. Be careful to not just swallow things out of loyalty to people. You have to be sure that when people communicate certain dimensions of spiritual reality, they have sustained the grace and the power to validate that claim. Otherwise, you may believe a lie for a long time and suffer sincerely. He says to be careful lest your light be darkness. I say this because there are several people, and I say this with, with a lot of respect and regard to the body of Christ. 
I've heard several people teach about the anointing, write books about the power of God, and I submit to you sincerely, very few people truly understand the power of God. It's true. Very few people. It's the reason why there is a lot of knowledge and there is no genuine manifestation of the power of God in the body. The Holy Spirit was never supposed to be isolated in your life, in your journey to spiritual power. He is not only the compass, he is the custodian of the power of God. The first revelation of the Godhead in the Bible was the Spirit of God. The Spirit of the living God. And the Spirit hovered around the face of the waters. When Ezekiel the prophet, listen carefully, it was the Spirit of God that took him to a valley that was full of dry bones. And he said, I prophesied as I was commanded and there was a sound. You sang it yesterday night. The rushing wind. The same wind that came in Acts chapter 2. Now, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, 2 verse 1 says, they were all gathered together in one accord. Then suddenly, the Bible says, there was a sound. Huh? That sound from heaven like a mighty rushing wind. And it came and filled the room where they were sitting. The Bible says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to pray in tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. witness he wants you to be a validator of a claim that when someone looks at you and says sorry i have i have heard that god can give people speed and acceleration in life is it true and then god says answer him you are my voice dear and you say yes it is true and he says but why is my life this way then the power you have received comes into the scene listen every witness has a token of truthfulness is called evidence everybody say evidence you are not a witness until you have evidence and evidence is a token of truthfulness that means that you must have something like an exhibit a proof that you were there if someone were stealing and you held a camera and captured it, that camera and the video that you show is your evidence. You cannot claim to be a witness for his majesty until you have evidence. So he gives you that power as the evidence, the validation that you are a witness. Listen carefully. The validation that you are a witness. Nicodemus came to Jesus in John chapter 3 by night. Here's what he said. Rabbi, we know that you are a witness. We know you are a man sent from God. Why? For no man can do these things. Not say these things. I write to you, O excellent Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and teach. Do and teach teach not teach alone do and teach a witness the only reason why they believed Jesus was sent from God was they saw certain results that could not have been human when Jesus resurrected and told Peter to cast his net and Peter caught fish he told him depart from me I'm a man of iniquity You must have that evidence as proof. Man of God, listen to me. It's not enough to just have revelation and share on stage. God is A, B, C, D. And then you say, I come in the name of the Lord. I am a man sent from God. If you are, where is your token of truthfulness? Like every student sitting here has an ID card. Is that true? If I claim to be a student of this university, for instance, or even a lecturer, you don't need to disturb yourself asking too many questions. Just ask one question. Show me your ID card or your admission letter. In the absence of either of the two, I do not have a token, a validation. 
So the power of God comes upon your life among other things as his signature upon you that you are authorized to represent him. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you and you shall be witnesses. Acts chapter 10 and verse 38. Peter was in the house of Cornelius being brought there by the vision that he saw. That would be the first time the Gentiles would come into salvation. And he said, how God anointed. Look at the extent to which God anointed Jesus Christ with the Holy Ghost and with power. Listen carefully. He went about doing what? You don't do good by good intention. It takes power. Doing good and healing all they that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. The messianic prophecy, Isaiah 61. The prophet is speaking and then he says, The spirit of the Lord is upon me, he says. For the Lord hath anointed me too. He begins to list the things, the possibilities that can happen. This was speaking about Jesus. But then prophetically it was also extending to the body. It takes the anointing to preach good tidings to the meek. It takes the anointing to bind the brokenhearted, not a bandage. It takes the anointing to proclaim liberty to the captives. The opening of prison to them that are bound. And then verse 2 says that to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, even the prophetic requires the anointing. It's not just saying God will do it. You proclaim under the influence of the anointing. And the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all that mourn, he says. To give them, to give them beauty for ashes. He says the oil of joy for mourning. The garment of praise. Listen, for the spirit of heaviness. He says that they might be called the trees or the oaks of righteousness. The planting of the Lord that he might be glorified. The power of God upon your life. Understand why you put this conference. Let it not just be a name and a ritual. Let it not just be understood by the leaders alone. I show you the necessity of spiritual power. Are we together? It is true. John chapter 1, 6 to 7. We are going to pray. Mighty God. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace that our hearts always hunger for. Oh, hearts always hunger for. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer, and our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger for. There was a man not sent from Zechariah not sent from elizabeth listen carefully you thought you were a kogi person no your body needed to have a geographic identification so the body comes from kogi state but the man is sent from god not sent by the intimacy of a father and a mother listen very carefully there was a man sent from God. When that man arrived the earth, they gave him a physical name to disguise that mystery that just came to the earth. And the name that was given was John. Next verse. The Bible says the same came. Stop. When you read everything about John, he just looks like a child that was born. But the Bible says he came. 
That means there are people who are not just born. They came. They came to families. They were supposed to stop at child number two. But prophecy made them come. They came. There was a man sent from God. His name was you. Sent. Listen carefully. You have to understand this. He was born into a family in Kogi state or in Nigeria. But the Bible says the same came for what? Please look at it. Read it. He came for, did they ever call John a witness in the Bible? Did you ever hear any human being say witness John? No. He was called prophet John. He was called Baptist John. Correct? But the Bible says he came for a witness. In other words, baptism was a strategy. Prophecy was the geography of his witness. John was not just a prophet. John was not just a Baptist. John was a witness. That means you are not just a student. Listen. That means you are not just a young man trying to make ends meet. Don't let your academics confuse you. Don't let your family confuse you. Don't let your skin color and your name confuse you. God is revealing you to you that you were sent as a witness. That when your grandfather was crying and said, Lord, I don't know you so much, but is this how we will continue? God had his prayer and you were sent. You look like a fragile baby that came and now is passing through the 6334 system to fulfill all righteousness. But let me tell you, more than this body, you are sent. And the Bible says you are sent to be a witness. I know you call yourself a prophet. I know you call yourself an apostle. You call yourself a business person, a career person. You are right. But now you are wrong. Because your assignment is a witness. To bear witness of the light. It says that men through the witness that he will bear might believe. That means that there is a validation of God that creation is waiting for through my life. There is a dimension of correction about the perception of God that my lifetime should produce. There is something about God that is as yet a contention that God sent you to correct. Can anything good come out of this family? And God says, son, come to this family and show them that God is able to pick a man from the dunk hill. So you just showed up as a young man and God says, remember, remember, remember. I know you are reading Agri, but remember, you came as a witness. There is a point to prove. I've given you a lifetime to make a statement that will correct something about man's understanding of me. Come. For instance, if this precious lady is barren look at this just an example do you really think satan is interested in children no what, what is the barrenness about the barrenness is not is not about lack of a child it's a statement satan is using her womb to make a statement to creation about god like a loudspeaker see the god you call faithful see the god you call great see the god you say is gracious and compassionate slow to anger and rich in love and mankind will say god we are beginning to doubt you and god says where are they where are they my reputation is under threat where are they and while he's asking you to come you are refusing to grow spiritually so you are delaying this your destiny has been allocated to answer this question but you got born again late and you are not even interested in spiritual growth. And while that delay is happening, someone is suffering from it and the name of Christ is about to be reproached. But I'm glad there are people from this conference. Hey. And suddenly you show up. Ah, ah. Are you not studying bizarre mean? Say no. 
this admin is only a disguise like a terrorist studying medicine he's not a doctor he's a terrorist he's only studying medicine to give him access to the space don't you know you are like a terrorist they do not know he says he says now it does not yet appear god concealed you he used everything about your life to shroud you like moses so that you would not be destroyed in egypt and so as it is creation does not yet know what you will become there is a formation happening but they think you are just an elder brother they think you are just a nice lady that likes prayer wow this lady likes prayer until god is done with you and they'll say so this is what we kept in our house i thought we kept the third born in our house you come to this lady now and say my dear do you believe God is love? She says, yes, but I'm frustrated. I'm about to go to a herbalist. And he said, no, 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 there's no point. God has sent me. Usually she will laugh. He has sent me to prove to you he still loves you. Say, but if he still loves you, where is the evidence? Say, now I receive power. The enablement to correct, to demonstrate, to validate and with just one touch, she will not only have a child, she will have triplets. Listen, it's not about children. It's a statement. Those are not children. Those are scriptures. Whoever comes to that house and looks at those children will not look at human beings. He's looking at a verse of scripture. I will restore the years that the canker worm has eaten. So the Bible says, let me tie it up, let's pray. It says, for I reckon, Romans chapter 8 and verse 18. I reckon, the word reckon means I come to terms with the fact that the sufferings of this present time, listen very carefully, is not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in you. That means on your path to accessing the anointing, there are constraints. You will fast, you will pray, you will make mistakes. Your surrender will make you look like you are stupid. And Paul is giving you a word of hope. He says, I, I agree. I come to terms with the fact that this thing is a sacrifice. I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, the constraints of waking up in the morning to pray, the constraints of staying when others are going, the constraints of hearing his voice before you move, he said it's not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be in you. Then 19 says for the earnest expectation. Everybody say expectation. That means God told creation wait some people are coming. And they have been saying we are waiting. We are waiting. Expectation. I told you I will give you 1,000. Wait for me here. And you've been waiting. Once it's 12 o'clock you will begin to get a little impatient. And creation is crying back to God and saying, Lord, how long? And God is replying you, how long? How long do you want them to wait? How long do you want your family to wait? How long do you want the destinies tied to you to wait? How long do you want the graces connected to you to wait? How long do you want those who are waiting for the prophetic word through your mouth to wait? How long do you want those who are appointed for death? For the earnest expectation of creation, the Bible says, awaited the manifestation of the sons of God. One of the versions says that creation is waiting for God to reveal those who his sons truly are. So that where you are, God is. Now it's true that God is everywhere through his spirit. But he sends men to be extensions of his possibilities within territories. That means that when someone says, is there God in Kogi state? You speak like Elijah. And you speak also like Elisha. Tell Naaman to come and let him know there is a prophet in Israel. That because of your presence on your campus, every time darkness seems to come, 
you stand like a pillar and say where to i represent the government of heaven and this is the token there is an ability that was given to me my brothers and my sisters listen to me i prepare your heart this morning for the evening we are going to pray i'm showing you the necessity and the purpose for spiritual power it is not all about ministry it takes the power of God to subdue the darkness that plague men. It takes the power of God to bear any possibility that you see in this kingdom. It takes the power of God to correct men's destinies. It takes the power of God to force the purposes of God to advance within a life and within a territory. And I'm glad to tell you that in the name of Jesus, within this conference, you must carry something like Saul, when he met with Samuel, he says he will go to the garrison of the Philistines. And then he will begin to prophesy like them. They saw him and they said, is Saul also one of them? They know that as at last week, you were just an ordinary believer who loved God. What suddenly happened in one week that your life has changed? You shook me yesterday and things changed in my life. Sorry, where did you go to? And you tell them there was a program over the weekend. I innocently came and sat down. And I didn't know that it was the voice of destiny calling to say it's time to rise to that level of power. It's time to rise to that level of grace. It's time to not only hear stories of the things that used to happen. It's time to not only read God's generals but become an extension. The book did not finish. How could it finish? The book left your own empty page there. This is one of the reasons why the Lord brought me here by the Spirit of God. To stir up our hearts and to call a solemn assembly of men and women who are truly desirous. Not just of power vaguely, but to see the possibilities of God find expression on your campus in this land. You see, if you love God and you love people, you will desire the power of God. Because darkness covers the earth. Look at your family left and right. Do you not discern that their cries are like the cries of Egypt over Moses? Lord, when will things change? And God is saying, son, they are asking you, not me. Because I have allocated their breakthrough to your grace. But you are yet to rise. It is the power of the Holy Spirit that will turn you into a sign and a wonder. It is the power of the Holy Spirit that will bring the end to every argument. Every doubt, whether you're a man of God or not, can end in a moment. That there is something God will place upon your life. And that would be it. There was a great man called Apostle Babalola. Many of you know his story. You read about how that man was accepted among the company of ministers. For a long time there was prophecy that a man was going to arise. And they had discerned that he was the one. But they refused to receive him into their company. It didn't make sense. He was too ordinary. And they said no. There has to be an evidence that convinces us that this is the man who represents the face of God's power for his generation. And then one day According to the story, that a madman meandered and was running around. And the group of people were in prayer. And they looked through the window and watched that madman come towards Apostle Babalola. And he held him, the madman and said, you are not mad. And the man came down there. And when the company of the prophets saw, they said, truly, truly. Was that not how they knew that the spirit of Elijah doth rest upon Elisha? When they saw the possibilities that happened, they said, ah, no, something has happened. The same way my brothers and my sisters, they will see something about your life and your roommate will say, wait, did you sit on this chair? Because when you left and I sat down, I don't know what happened. I fell asleep and all of a sudden, I started seeing things about my destiny. 
and you say i was not even praying i only sat no you were a distributor of spiritual possibilities you brought something to that room and so we're going to pray this morning and ask the lord to prepare our hearts we've woken up early in the morning to pray still an extension of the conference I am a witness, although a pastor. I am a witness, although a student. I am a witness, although a lady. Everyone say, I am a witness. Never forget this word for the rest of your life. Yes. A witness is a validator. A validator. A validator. Please remember. That means that everywhere you see God's name about to be reproached, something is calling you there. Like a politician, if you see someone tearing the, pla the flag of your party, whether you are contesting, you say, why? There is a solidarity, a witness. Some of you, even from this morning, you will call your loved ones to say, prepare. The answer is coming. And they say, what are you saying? I thought you would say, send me some money, I'm broke. You say, mommy, I know you think I'm joking. I always call, but listen, something is coming from heaven. God is finally about to wipe the tears of this family. That's why we travel from region to region to challenge believers that you are witnesses. Not just a man of God, but everybody. And that God and creation is counting on your validation of God's name. The name of God is in jeopardy waiting for you to correct that perception. First from your family then extended to people around you somebody is about to be thrown out of school now not because he is dull but there is a spirit that has taken advantage of everybody in his family they told you about it the last time and what you said is hey yeah and god is saying not so not after this conference you go back and say my brother what did you say used to happen to you again he said, I thought you we sympathize. We cried. He said, no, I've not come to sympathize. It takes the anointing to comfort those who mourn. And let me show you what comfort means. Comfort does not mean to just pass you through. Comfort means to change it. Someone has written YA 10 times, done everything to do. And then you tell the person in the name of Jesus, as touching this kingdom that I represent, I move you. Say, I want stupid statement. Until his result comes out. And he said, this is not my result. Say, of course it's not your result. Of course it's not your result. This is God speaking through you. That I am still God. Is there someone here who sincerely is ready to say, Lord, in my time and in my generation, I will not fail you. If you are searching for witnesses, I thought I was just the last born. I thought I was just the first born. But I'm tired of just being an ordinary person. They call me pastor. But there is no evidence. and talk to the Lord this is the conference that makes my life Lord I've attended several conferences I have even organized others myself but this time around I'm not carried away my spirit is open there has to be an evidence upon my life
Alléluia. 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 Jeremiah 51 and verse 20. We are still praying. Jeremiah 51. If it can be projected, that would be fine. But he said, Thou art my battle axe. He didn't say you have it. You are it. Thou art my battle axe. And weapons of war. He says, For with thee I will break into pieces the nations. And with you I will destroy kingdoms. Very important. Zechariah chapter 1, please. And verse 19. We are praying. Zechariah chapter 1. And he said unto the angel that talked with me, What be these? And he answered, These are horns. A horn is a symbol of authority. These horns have scattered Judah. They have scattered Israel. They have scattered Jerusalem. Next verse. The next verse. And the Lord showed me four carpenters. 21. And said, what come these to do? The horns now. And he spake saying, these are horns which have scattered Judah. Read on with me. So that no man did lift up his head. Listen. There are horns, my brothers and my sisters, that sit upon lives and families and destinies. They, they draw a line and say nobody rises. It says, but these carpenters have come. The word phrase, the word to terrorize them. To cast out the horns of the Gentiles which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah to scatter it. It takes power to bring darkness at bay. It takes power. It says, Behold, I give you power. Luke 10, 19. It's the word exousia, authority. I delegate you to tread upon snakes and scorpions, he says. And over every power of the enemy. Is someone ready to pray? And you are going to declare and pray. And say, Father, I'm contacting grace. That will grant me the ability to rot terrible things in righteousness. On behalf of my life, my family. The power of the Holy Spirit. He barataka parusa segeni balana. Please pray. Hallelujah. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. I'm rounding up now. Second Peter chapter 1. 
Apostle Peter is teaching us something very powerful. He says, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. Read verse 3 if you are a Christian. One, two, read. Stop. 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 Don't rush. What is the agency that makes all things possible? His divine power. Not according to faith. Your faith is only a connector. The agency, the force that grants things unto men, even the things that pertain to life and godliness, is called his divine power. The agency that prospers is his divine power. The agency that moves a man is his divine power. That means if that divine power is absent in your life, you cannot access all things that pertain unto life and godliness. His divine power. Lifting you in ministry, his divine power. Bringing favor, his divine power. Turning every negative prophecy around, his divine power. Elijah was a man of like passion. He provoked the divine power of God and shut the heavens for a space of three and a half years. Repeated the same thing to open the heavens, his divine power. Let me tell you this. It is not an act of flesh and carnality, provided your motif has been adjusted to cry for a genuine manifestation of the power of God upon your life. In a dimension, I will teach you certain things about the anointing tonight before the impartation that will change your life. And one of it, let me just give you an understanding, we're wrapping up, is that you see the power of God is in levels and is in measures. Listen carefully. And... It is only the challenge that is within the level of the power of God that you can dispense, that can be solved. Listen carefully. That means, come sir, look at this gentleman. Let's assume this gentleman has delay in his life. Let's assume this gentleman has the spirit of death attempting to oppress him. And let's assume that this gentleman has something wrong with his organs. And let's assume this gentleman is not doing well academically. And let's also assume this gentleman is not doing well financially. I've listed a number of issues, isn't it? I pray for this as a man of God. He may even fall down. But you see, every challenge that he has is like an item in the store. There is a level of anointing required to solve it. So, as the anointing goes through his body, the limitation of the anointing I carry, the anointing I carry, for instance, if it can only solve academic problems, he will fall and stand up and have only testimonies in the academics. That means that the remaining part of his life, there was limitation. Are you seeing that now? You know your level of anointing by the testimonies that keep recycling around your life. When certain dimensions have not been captured, it means the grace is not there. Period. So when you really love this brother, you must rise to a level of anointing where every challenge that he comes is within your grace to solve. And one prayer, just a tap on the head, he may think is a joke until he goes back and finds out that all doors have opened. And he says, what kind of grace is this? How God anointed Jesus. Are you seeing now? Not only that he was anointed, he was so anointed that regardless of what your issue were, if you came to him, it was child's play. You are going to cry. Some of you have tasted of the anointing. Lord, multiply this grace upon my life to a level and a degree. Multiply. Hey, 
Barandega Barasuka Bahadesh. Embrecatella Satuka de Gibala. Alléluia. 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 The last prayer point for this morning. Listen. I hope I have the time to share with you a few of my personal stories by evening. But I'll just share just one of them, two minutes, and we're done. A number of you have heard it in the teachings. You see, when you see all these manifestations and these dimensions of the Spirit at work in my life and everywhere I go to minister, there is an explanation for it. It is not just that a man was lucky to be picked by God. No, it was not always like that. Praise the Lord. I'm trying to stimulate your desire. You see, let me tell you sincerely. For many years, I saw the power of God in dimensions that very few people had seen. And I thought, wow, I'd seen the power of God. I've seen all kinds of miracles. I've seen all kinds of things. Until I began to have certain levels of encounters with God. And then I knew that this thing called anointing is truly in levels and in measures. I would never have people healed and touched and blessed until I specifically called them out, laid hands on them, or minister to them. If I didn't minister to you, you may be blessed from the teaching, but the influence of that presence was not strong enough to touch you where you were. And I knew there was a problem because how then do you minister to nations? How then do you speak from a point and everybody within that territory gets blessed? Until in one of my encounters, I saw a mighty angel of the Lord. The Lord spoke to me. He said, son, from this day, I give you my presence as a gift. And then I saw an angel. And the Lord told me, this angel will walk with you. He's called the angel of the Lord's presence. I said, wow, I thought the angel of the Lord's presence was God himself. And from that time, that's what happens when you listen to the teachings and when I stand and you see people shaking around, it is the influence of these spiritual possibilities. I'm explaining it to you so that you will understand. It's true. So I'm, 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 I'm opening you up to see that there can be more. Don't stay small in your little fellowship here and there, one healing, one prophecy, one miracle, one revelation, one Greek, one Hebrew. Please leave shadows and come into substance. Beyond a realm of comparison and competition and the need. No. There is a level where God brings you into a dimension of grace that will only leave you humble. I have seen things in this my life I pray that your heart will truly be open to receive something in this conference. Hallelujah. So all through today while you attend your lectures and prepare for the night, please don't be careless. Are we together now? If I were you, I would prepare my heart. Even whilst I'm listening to lectures, Lord, this is a once in a lifetime thing. The dream and the visions that you had, let it come back to your mind. Hear the voices of those people who were crying again as you prepare for the night. The dream about your mother calling for help, let it come again. As you walk down the street, don't be careless, gisting, eating around and wasting time. Find a corner and say, Lord, this is it, this is it, this is it. Graces that you once touched that you have lost. You just know that one day is like you saw a vision, but you don't know where it went to again. I'm going to say, Lord, like the hair of Samson, it must return in this conference. 
Let me pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for your people. And I ask you, oh God, that the activity of the Holy Spirit that must happen in a man to cause that man to be able to host your power and your presence. Lord, that between this morning and even the evening, when your people will come to receive, I pray and I cry to you, O God of heaven, let these supernatural activities begin in the life of your people. Yeah. The consecrations, the alignments, the corrections of motif, every adjustment that needs to happen to enlarge your vessel he said borrow vessels borrow not a few whatever oh god will need to be emptied out of their lives to create space i pray that between this morning and the evening spirit of the living god find comfort in causing them to be empty to receive that anointing And I pray for you that whatever you need to hear or see before this evening, whatever you need to be reminded of by the Spirit to prepare your heart again to receive, I pray for you sincerely. Let your morning, even up to evening, be full of very strange encounters. <laughs> I agree with you. Listen to me. The distractions that reduce you back from the realm of spirituality and focus. Because he told Elisha, if you can see me, it takes focus to receive. Some of you, the devil will try to bring offense. Between now and evening, someone has annoyed you. You frown your way to this place and receive nothing. No. I pray that the love and the power of God will garrison your heart and your mind. Yeah. That nothing will offend you and nothing will, will corrupt the preparation of your heart to host this dimension of God's grace. In the name of Jesus Christ. Dearly beloved, I hope you were blessed by this message. Do not keep the video to yourself share to as many as you can to help them bless. Check our home page for more of our messages, subscribe to the channel, comment on it, like it. See you on our next video. Bye! Pray! Pray! Pray for your destiny! The phase of development. Lord, grant me the discipline.